Welcome back to the Move Consciousness podcast. This episode, we're going to focus on the intersection of law, psilocybin, and end-of-life care. Our guest is an attorney who has fought for patients' right to die with dignity and have access to substances that help with end-of-life care for the terminally ill population. Catherine L. Tucker is special counsel at Emerge Law Group, where she co-chairs the Psychedelic Practice Group. Ms. Tucker served as lead counsel representing patients and physicians in two landmark federal cases decided by the United States Supreme Court, Washington v. Glucksburg and Baco v. Quill, asserting that mentally competent, terminally ill patients have a constitutional right to choose aid in dying. These cases have helped bring nationwide attention to improving care of the dying and to have established a federal constitutional right to aggressive pain management. Her most recent focus has been on utilizing an existing law called Right to Try to help terminally ill patients access psilocybin. If you want to learn more about our guest or the episode content, go to moveconsciousness.com slash RTT. That's moveconsciousness.com slash RTT. One last thing. We want to give a disclaimer that the episode does not give legal advice and there's no attorney-client relationship being formed. With that being said, let's get started. All right, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here today. So your career has really taken such an interesting path. So it has this intersection of law, end-of-life care, psychedelics, and politics. So I I thought to start off, um, I'd really like to hear what motivated you to go down such an interesting, unconventional path. Well, thanks for the question. It's now been a really long path, but it has been very interesting. When I first was a young lawyer, I had come out of uh, law school hoping to do some public interest work, I went into a large law firm and found that my choices of what I could work on were constrained because of conflicts with existing firm clients. And so I ended up almost randomly, but is it ever really random, finding my way to becoming the lawyer representing the first initiative campaign in the country for death with dignity. And that was in the state of Washington in 1991. And I was a very young lawyer, but I was at a big firm and the campaign did not have counsel. And when I offered my services, they were happy to take them. And then that campaign um, really increased my interest of the civil liberties at stake when the rights of a dying patient to choose a kind of death that is most consistent with their values, beliefs, and preferences. Mm -hmm. And so I became very committed to that issue. Um, The campaign in Washington State that year was not successful. However, it was the shoulders that was stood upon in the successful campaign in Oregon in 1994 which Oregon did become the first state to adopt a Death with Dignity Act. And I stayed in that line of work advocating on behalf of terminally ill patients really for the whole rest of my career. And it's had many chapters to it. And the most recent chapter involves psychedelic medicine. And that was a bit of a surprise to find myself in this arena, but I think it's, there's important work to be done. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Just out of curiosity, so the Washington case, what city, was that based out of Olympia since that's the capital or was it somewhere else? So in Washington state in 1991, there was a citizen initiative that qualified for the ballot statewide where citizens voted on the question of whether a dying patient could have physician assistance in dying. So it was a statewide citizen initiative. It came close to passing, but not quite. And Mm -hmm. then um, in Oregon in 1994, as mentioned, it was also a citizen statewide initiative that allowed aid in dying, uh, sometimes called death with dignity in that state. Right. Yeah. I also saw your um, 
Chakruna article, that was from 2019, where you were talking about, the title of it is, Can the Psychedelic Movement Learn from the Movement for End-of-Life Liberty? And that really discussed this, this interesting intersection of all of these different really important parts that you've come across throughout your career. Yeah, I mean, I do think different movements to reform law can learn from each other if we can lift our nose away from the grindstone and see what lessons might be there. And one of the things that I was trying to bring attention to in that Chakruna article is the experience with the Death with Dignity movement has been that when the first state passes its law, as it did in, in Oregon, Death with Dignity in 1994, that will very likely become a template or a model replicated elsewhere. And so it's smart to ask what that first enactment should look like, because you're probably going to be dealing with it in replicated form. And, you know, one of the things that came back to bite us in the Death with Dignity movement was in order to draft the initiative in a way that was politically viable, it was burdened with so many restrictions and limitations that after these laws became effective, it made it very difficult and it remains difficult for patients to access aid in dying. And I wanted to bring that out so that we could think about that as laws are being drafted with regard to psychedelic access. Could you give an example of um, some of that wording that has made it difficult for patients to access it? Yeah. So, for example, there are so many restrictions on who qualifies as a patient. The patient must be mentally competent. The patient must be terminally ill. Um, the patient must make multiple requests for this medication. The request mm -hmm. must be witnessed uh, by unrelated witnesses. There must be a minimum 15 day waiting period from the first and the final request. Mm -hmm. And all of those different regulatory restrictions have made it difficult for patients to access. And so we've often heard of patients who die in the interim between the two requests uh, because most people put off thinking about end of life until they're really in crisis. Right. And so a terminally ill patient in crisis makes the request and yet they die before the 15 days elapses. So it's now taken many years of witnessing that and a fresh new legislative effort to revise those restrictions, to make them less burdensome. Uh, and that's a difficult path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also wonder how does something like insurance status and funding impact the patient's ability to go through this process in a, in a quick ethical fashion? Because being able to get all, you know, into all of those places that would accept your insurance, or if you have no insurance, places that would accept you, you know, those are also just systemic public health problems. Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, these are the things that you have to think through. I will say that what ended up happening with the first state psilocybin services measure which was passed by citizen initiative in Oregon in the fall of 2020 is it did adopt a heavily regulatory approach. Um, so the advice that I offered in the Chakruna article really was not followed uh, for better or for worse. And what we see in the Oregon psilocybin services act is, you know, a, a, something like a 70 page heavily regulatory enactment. Um, and I do think that that is likely now to serve as something of a model. Um, and, you know. You're like, damn it, why didn't they read my article? <laughs> why didn't they? <laughs> that must be frustrating because you pointed it out clearly. Right. Now, the, the Oregon measure, it got a lot of popularity. It even, you know, received a $1 million donation from Dr. Bronner's, a soap company, which seemed kind of out of the blue. 
Well, Dr. Bronner company and David Bronner in particular have been outspoken supporters of opening access to these medicines, these plant medicines in particular, that show promise of relief in mental health challenges. Mm -hmm. And so that's not a new involvement of that philanthropist. Um, and he's been involved in a number of different efforts. I believe they're also making a donation to support some psychedelic research institutions in New York recently as well. So yeah. Yeah, this is very, it's not atypical for that organization, but it is uncommon to see a company just donate towards something like this. So I'm, I'm glad to see that. And I hope we see more things like that in the future. Yeah, so there is now a psychedelic funder network that the Dr. Bronner company I know is involved with, where philanthropists who want to come into this space can gather and learn about the opportunities and how best to support the work. So that's really exciting too. Oh, that is exciting. That's great. This is the first time I'm hearing of it. So I'll, I'll look into it some more. That's yeah. excellent. Another major focus of yours has been on right to try advocacy. Yes. That is a new involvement. And this is based largely on the Gonzalez versus Oregon case from 2006, correct? Well, that case will have an impact on this right to try effort. But the effort is founded on state and federal statutes, which are called right to try acts. And what these acts do is recognizing that terminally ill patients don't have the luxury of time to wait for the very long process of new drug approval to go through uh, to the end. Mm -hmm. The recognition is that for this population of patients, if an investigational drug has passed a phase one clinical trial and remains under investigation, it should be available for therapeutic use for terminally ill patients who want to access it. Mm -hmm. So looking at those laws, um, it came clear to me as I was working on the Oregon psilocybin services measure that they appeared to apply to psilocybin because of course that is true with psilocybin. It has indeed successfully cleared phase one clinical trials. It has moved on to later stage investigation and it remains under investigation. So for terminally ill patients, it should be accessible under right to try uh, for that population. And that's the project that I've launched into. And, and I now represent an integrative oncology clinic in Seattle and its palliative care director and a number of the patients who receive care for advanced cancer at this clinic. And we have embarked into the process of seeking psilocybin for this palliative care clinician to be able to use therapeutically with the patients as appears to be permitted by right to try. And that's what we will be pursuing um, in uh, a judicial review of what is the scope of right to try? Does it apply to psilocybin, which is a schedule one substance? Mm -hmm. And so that's an interesting wrinkle. There has not been, to my knowledge, an attempt to apply right to try to a schedule one substance. And yet we know if you take a look at some of the 41 state right to try acts, some of them specifically exclude schedule one substances, which makes clear that when exclusion was intended, it appears in the language of the statute. That is not the case for the federal enactment, nor the Washington state enactment where our test case is. So we'll be pressing to have right to try applied to psilocybin, even though it is a schedule one substance. So many interesting things coming out of the Pacific Northwest. I love yes, it. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 
And just for our listeners, the phase one trials are typically the ones that are just testing to see, you know, is the substance, is the treatment safe? Yes. And with regard to psilocybin, if you've been following the published studies, what we've seen is not only a determination of very good safety, but remarkable efficacy. And this is what really caused me to sit up and take notice because what I can say from 30 years of work to improve end of life care, we've made many strides to address physical pain and suffering and increase the choices available to patients to address physical pain and suffering. But less progress has been made with regard to non-physical suffering which is what psilocybin addresses, anxiety, depression, existential distress. And even though it's non-physical, it's a mental, emotional aspect, it still impacts quality of life in a way that is can sometimes be even greater. Enormously, absolutely. And it could also, mm-hmm. and this is something to keep in mind as well, influence a patient's decision about whether to exercise their right to advance the time of death with death with dignity. So you could certainly Mm -hmm. imagine that not only would therapeutic uh, psilocybin improve the patient's state of mind, but it could impact those other decisions about how long to continue to live with their terminal illness, and it could extend life. We don't have data Mm -hmm. on that, but certainly it seems intuitively possible. Yeah, I saw this great documentary. It was following, I believe, a British man who had um, ACLS. And it was, you know, it's a progressive disease. And he was worried that he was going to lose pretty rapidly control of his his body and his mind. So he had made the decision to do um, a death with dignity assisted suicide in Switzerland. Yeah. If I can find the video, I'll link it on the episode page. But that's what came to mind when you said, you know, because people have different progressions of disease or their health could deteriorate quite rapidly. So, you know, it's it's great when there are more options available. Absolutely. And I want to go back to something you said a little bit earlier, too. You were talking about, you know, it doesn't psilocybin data. It doesn't just look good, but it's been pretty remarkable. And that's really when we're talking about like the phase three data. How does it how does this substance compare to the standard of care treatment. And you're right, it's been it's been pretty incredible. Yes. Yes. I mean, really the findings boil down to the patients who've had very difficult unrelieved anxiety and depression are essentially finding relief from a single guided psilocybin therapy session and that relief is enduring because they have checked back over Mm -hmm. time to see if the depression and anxiety has returned. And those findings have been very impressive as well. It's been remarkable compared to the pharmacological standard of care that we see. It's just been incredible. And I believe in some of those cases, they often rank that single exposure, that single experience as one of the most profound experiences of their life, right up there with the, you know, the birth of their children sometimes. Yes. Yeah. And so you do wonder why would there be a barrier, uh, particularly given the enactment of these right to try statutes, which acknowledges that dying patients don't have a long time. Why would there be opposition to their accessing the investigational drug psilocybin, which has been shown to be so efficacious in improving quality of life? It's almost mind boggling to imagine uh, opposing that. And so we are on the front end of this effort. I hope it will be successful. It has the potential to open access to this important drug for this population under existing law. And that's really exciting. Yeah. And, you know, on the same topic of safety, psilocybin is shown to be quite safe. Like the lethal dose that it would take, it's it's much safer than so many other substances out yeah. there. And I really like that model of psilocybin assisted therapy. So you're still with someone who can help you, who's 
can hold space for you, can help you with what your goals are, and you can do it in a safe setting. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, um, you know, that's why I think we have a strong case where we have a very highly respected palliative care physician who has come forward with his patients and on behalf of his patients um, mm -hmm. to make clear that this would be happening in a controlled therapeutic environment. Um, so there really shouldn't be any sort of concerns about, um, you know, inappropriate use of this drug. Right. Especially if you're like a stage four cancer patient, it's metastasized to other sites, you're, you know, the current treatment you're on, you're resistant to, the tumors are still growing. It's nice to have another option because the treatment is rough, not only on the patient, but on the entire support. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So that's why we're so excited about it. And you had mentioned, you know, what is the import of the Oregon v. Ashcroft case. Um, and I'll circle mm -hmm. back to that. I, I represented the patients in that litigation um, that went from the federal district court in Oregon uh, to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals to the Supreme Court of the United States. And what was at issue there was an attempt by the then Attorney General to use the Federal Controlled Substances Act to punish any physician who would provide death with dignity under the Oregon statute. And what the court at every level said is that that was an impermissible overreach by that federal official. And mm. that the primary responsibility for the regulation of the practice of medicine falls to the states. And so if a state has enacted a law determining that a particular medical practice is permitted in that state, it is not permissible for the attorney general uh, to apply the Controlled Substances Act to nullify that state law. That reasoning is very applicable to our right to try case because when Washington state adopted its right to try statute in 2017, which by the way, was a unanimous vote. Uh, every legislator in the state of Washington voted in favor of the law, which is kind of unheard of. Um, that was a declaration that the wisdom of the state legislature was that this medical practice was permitted in this state. So for the DEA to obstruct that would be an overreach. And the DEA um, must find a way to accommodate right to try because it is the law of the land and it is the law of 41 states. Right. And you said something so important there. I just want to, I just want to reiterate it. There was such a unanimous vote amongst politicians, which we never see for the right to try. And this was in Washington. If I remember right, it's, it was 97 to zero in support in the House and 48 to zero support in the Senate. Yes, correct? quite impressive. Yeah, so that's just, I mean, especially in 2021 with everything we've seen over the last four years, like that is impressive. Yeah. This is a topic that crosses political boundaries. Like everyone at this point, pretty much knows someone who has had cancer, someone who has struggled. And this is this is one area where I think we can actually see bipartisan support. Yes. Yes, I hope that's right. And and that's why as this case gets up and running, I hope that we will see the legislators from the state of Washington that voted unanimously to support this law. I hope they will consider submitting a friend of the court brief I hope that the Washington State Attorney General will step up and defend a duly enacted Washington State law. Um, certainly when the attempt was made to nullify the Oregon Death with Dignity Act, the Oregon Attorney General stepped up and was the lead plaintiff in the case now known as uh, Gonzalez versus Oregon. And um, so I'd like to see that happen here, and I think it very likely will. 
So we have some listeners in Washington State. Like, would you recommend if this is something that they were fully in support of that they contact a particular legislature in the state? Or well, I think that um, interested Washingtonians can find opportunity to either encourage their legislators to join an amicus brief to defend the state right to try. They, if they're part of other organizations, you know, for example, there's an end of life organization in Washington state um, that I know already intends to participate as a friend of the court. Um, The Washington ACLU, I expect, will participate. And so I think there will be a number of different groups stepping forward. And so interested listeners could either get in touch with me and I can direct them toward one of those coalitions. Um, That might be the easiest way. Okay. So, yeah, I'll make sure um, that your contact information is available on the episode page and and they can get a hold of you if they'd like to be more involved. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. So you mentioned drug scheduling a little bit earlier. Um, I just wonder if we could talk about that a little bit more. So psilocybin is considered a schedule one substance. So it means it has a high potential for addiction and no medicinal benefit. Yes, theoretically, that is the scheduling criteria. And something that we had talked about in our conversation previously was this this path to changing scheduling seems to be much more challenging and politically motivated versus the right to try. It's it's already a path that seems like it fits. Yes. Well, and, you know, rescheduling, normally one would expect the conclusion of the FDA process through all the levels of clinical trials. And at the conclusion of all of that, the FDA would make a recommendation to the DEA and the DEA would undertake the examination of whether rescheduling was proper. And so we're years away from that with regard to psilocybin. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly, you know, if you're following what the history has been with regard to cannabis, There have been efforts to reschedule cannabis, which also sits on Schedule 1. And those efforts have not been successful. And, you know, Mm -hmm. it's now many years later and efforts to reschedule are still underway. More and more states legalizing it. We still haven't seen a federal legalization. That's correct. That's correct. So I hope that Right to Try offers a more direct route and and a faster route to access. And really, um, for the federal statute and the 41 state statutes, um, because very few of them exclude Schedule I substances, only a few make that exclusion. For example, the state of Missouri excludes Schedule One substances from its right to try law. That actually mm-hmm. is uh, the subject of a legislative bill to change that in this uh, session of the legislature in Missouri to to get rid of the exclusion. But that sort of exclusion would need to be added to the Washington state right to try and to the federal right to try statute if exclusion of Schedule 1 was meant to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So many different aspects for this and obviously depends what state we're talking about. And then you have to consider always the federal implications as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Um, You know, with regard to the state federal interface, one of the interesting realities about the Oregon Psilocybin Services Initiative um, is that even though it makes access to psilocybin services legal under Oregon state law, that would remain illegal under federal law. And so one Mm -hmm. of the questions, of course, is whether there will evolve a policy of the federal government 
to refrain from prosecuting conduct made legal under the Oregon Act. Similar to cannabis, correct? How like we have dispensaries in California because it's legal statewide and the federal government could technically come in and apply federal law, but that's just not, there's not the political motivation to do so. Right. So we did see that evolve with cannabis, although it's very much a creature of the political wind. So when um, there was a memo issued by a DOJ official during the Obama administration, it's referred to as the Cole Memorandum, basically saying if a state had made this legal, the federal government would refrain from prosecution. That memorandum was revoked, rescinded, when Jeff Sessions became the attorney general. And so it very much depends on who the office holder is at the Department of Justice, which doesn't give a lot of comfort, um, particularly to, you know, physicians who must maintain their federal licensure, um, their DEA registration to prescribe medications. Right. And we're talking about something like quality of life for end of life care for patients. So this isn't something that we would want to be so attached to political motivation. These are areas that we like to be a little more stable. Yes, you would (laughs) hope so. But we did just see a promising set of comments from the Attorney General nominee Merrick Garland, which has import for both cannabis and the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act, where his comments were to the effect, if a state has legalized and regulated, the federal government will not expend its resources on prosecutions. So it seems Mm. to be a return to the cooperative federalism model that was reflected in the Cole Memorandum. That bodes well um, for the operation of the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act. Right. So back on the the Oregon initiative, so that's a 50-page measure so it's complex. You said it was very regulatory heavy. Yeah. Um, and, and something else I want to bring up is, so it's it has a 2023 enactment of that law, correct? There's a two-year waiting period? Well, the law has been enacted, but there will be no access to psilocybin. There will no, be no psilocybin services prior to 2023. It has a two-year development period baked in to the front end. And the concept is in that two-year period, a psilocybin advisory board will be impaneled um, to advise the Oregon Health Authority on all kinds of things, including what kind of training does a facilitator need before they can be licensed to provide psilocybin services. One of the interesting Mm -hmm. things about the Oregon measure, it does not require that a facilitator hold any sort of professional education credential. So it doesn't uh, require that you be a doctor or a therapist or a social worker, none of that. So what's going to be Mm -hmm. really important to successful function of this uh, type of service is that the training be adequate and sufficient so that the facilitators can do a good job. And I'm already seeing some of these certifications in this realm. They're not cheap. They're in the thousands of dollars range. Mm -hmm. And that's before all this framework is even done. Yeah, I, I see those notices as well. And I think what they reflect is, you know, the tremendous excitement about the possibility of expanding the toolbox of tools that treat difficult mental health conditions. Because of course, psilocybin, while it's shown so efficacious with regard to relief of non-physical suffering in terminally ill patients, has a multitude of other promising applications. Um, So I think there's just a tremendous excitement and a lot of these courses are being offered um, in anticipation 
of being able to provide this kind of service. So we expect to see possibly MDMA with FDA approval within the next couple of years if things keep going in the way they are now, which is just another option for people who need the help. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the silver linings of the pandemic and COVID has been that with an upsurge in mental health challenges, nobody wants to turn down a promising tool for addressing those challenges. So if you are a terminally ill patient in Oregon now in 2021, you have to wait until 2023 during that waiting period. And a lot of these terminally ill patients may not last that long. So are there no legal options within the state of California for a terminally ill patient right now? Well, so if this test case that we are moving forward in Seattle is successful and the outcome of that case is that terminally ill patients Um, are to be able to access psilocybin for therapeutic use under right to try, that ruling, um, that outcome would apply from coast to coast. And it could open access access in Oregon before 2023 uh, for that population of patients. I'm wondering what your thoughts are. So this is even more reason for people, especially legal access to psilocybin increases motivated to help with this. What lessons could we learn from the cannabis industry? Because when Mm -hmm. cannabis became legal at state levels, the cost of it went up exponentially and terminally ill patients who really need it the most they need the high dose ones to help with pain and whatever their symptoms are it's it can just be unaffordable for many so i'm curious what your thoughts are on as things are changing and they're going in the direction of pro psilocybin and access um what kind of things can we do from a, a policy or an implementation standpoint to help make sure that people who need access affordable access to these substances can do that? That's such an interesting question. So the Oregon Psilocybin Services Act is written in a way where the psilocybin could be from any sort of production process. So as you may know, psilocybin is produced by the psilocybin mushroom with that adorable little fungi that, you know, creates a dosage for pennies a serving. Um, It can also be synthesized in a laboratory, and it is the synthetic psilocybin that is being used in clinical trials. Um, And there is a dramatic price differential. So... Whether um, going forward, we are looking at the naturally grown psilocybin mushroom versus a laboratory synthesized capsule will be part of the answer to your question. Mm. Yeah, you're right. If, If spores were available, I think that most Americans could learn to grow enough psilocybin containing mushrooms in their home in a very affordable rate. And that was a big consideration in the California statewide decriminalization effort was to make sure that, you know, people were allowed to grow their own mushrooms at home. Yeah. Well, I mean, as you know, at present in 47 of the 50 states, it is legal to order the spores. The spores don't have the active agent because they're immature and it's only upon maturity that the substance becomes governed by the controlled substances act so in some sense and i recently published a law review article that talks about this in some sense you could imagine a terminally ill patient ordering the spores doing their own grow and the likelihood of that person being prosecuted for that seems vanishingly small. Mm -hmm. Um, And yet, you know, for many terminally ill patients, undertaking that task with all they're dealing with, with their illness, 
just seems burdensome. They may very well have concerns about quality control and dosage, mm. et cetera. And so I think we do far better by that population by enabling a clinician to obtain access to a known um, quality controlled product. I agree. Yeah, especially especially if they're undergoing things like chemo, like they're not going to have the energy. They're going to be dealing with fatigue and nausea and vomiting. They're not going to have the motivation possibly to, you know, look after their own, their own garden. <laughs> Hence our effort uh, under Right to Try. Excellent. So we've been talking about end of life care. We've been talking about the intersection of law and psychedelics. I'm just curious what your perspective of death is. Like, what do you think happens when we die? Where do we go? What are your thoughts? Since you asked, I mean, my own view is that we are on an evolutionary journey that likely involves a multitude of lifetimes. In my life outside of the law, I'm very engaged in practices in yoga, and I'm also a yoga teacher, and I'm very reverent about the yoga teachings that all teach that. We're here for this lifetime to learn and to grow and to find ways to be of service, and then we go on to a next lifetime. That was very poetic. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Did you have any final words for our audience? I'd love for anyone who hears it, who's excited about this work, to know that we've established a fund so that we can do the work. And that fund, which is referred to as the RTT Advocacy Fund, sits at a nonprofit called the NOAC Society. And I'd be happy to send you the information about how people who might want to support this work can do that by making a contribution to that fund. Oh, absolutely. That's excellent. Yeah. Anyone who's listening to this, if they want to get involved, contribute. That's, I mean, money is something that you need for these and that's one great way to help. Yes. There you have it. That's our episode on psilocybin and right to try law. If you'd like to learn more about our guest, how to get involved, or if you'd like to make a donation to the legal efforts, check out the episode page at moveconsciousness.com slash RTT. That's moveconsciousness.com slash RTT. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to hit the share button and send it to someone that you think might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.